We'll get into uh, the Saturday NFL and Sunday, every day. news and notes. John McMullen, of course, uh, every day at this time. He joins us. Uh, I got uh, a lot of questions on this uh, San Diego move, uh, how it all uh, fell apart in San Diego. The skinny from John McMullen here on 97.3 ESPN. John, uh, so we have the L.A. Chargers. Uh, they changed their Twitter account uh, almost instantaneous. The uh, home of the Los Angeles Chargers. Um, let, let me start with this question. The NFL was going to pony up $300 million towards a stadium, correct? Correct. The San Diego Chargers must pay $650 million to relocate, correct? Correct. Okay. You got $950 million right there. Those two entities could not come together to come up with some more capital to stay in San Diego is what you're telling me? Or did the league and or Dean Spanos want nothing to do with remaining in San Diego? No, I think the league wanted the team in San Diego. Uh, and I think Dean Spanos actually wanted to remain in San Diego. I don't think they want to share the market. Certainly the Rams didn't want them in Los Angeles. So, so from the league perspective, uh, certainly the status quo would have been the preferred method. Uh, and, yeah, do they have the money to do that? They certainly have the money to do that, the league, to do to build stadiums on their own. But they're very wary of setting a precedent, and they consider it a um, sort of a, a, a partnership with the cities. And generally the, the, the way to go has been there's – uh, the ownership chips in, the NFL chips in, the city chips in. Uh, they tried every which way possible. I, I think it's a political, uh, hot, you know, uh, uh, football issue in San Diego and the fact that it's a very progressive city, it's a very progressive state, and they're very wary of subsidizing billionaires. You constantly hear, hear that terminology. Uh the funny thing is, though, is that cities subsidize billionaires every day. It's just not on the front page of the newspaper. Uh, and when it involves the NFL and professional sports, it gets a lot. Of, uh, it gets a lot of attention, and and politicians get scared, and they didn't want to get involved. And now we'll see how it how it affects them down the line. Because now that the Chargers are actually gone, well, people are going to start pointing fingers. So, uh, so and most of them. Will, go ahead. Most of them will point fingers at Spanis, but that's you know, I, I mean, the status quo has been a three-tier partnership, and San Diego wasn't willing to get involved. It's as simple as that. So. If you're placing blame as to why the Chargers are in Los Angeles today, where does it start? It starts with, to me, it starts with the politicians in San Diego. Uh, as I said, there's this, and it's very disingenuous because you will hear it. We, I think we can all stipulate that there are far more important things than professional football. Uh, nobody questions that. Nobody argues with it. Certainly the education of children, the economy, whatever you want to throw out there is far more important than football. Uh, but the two are not mutually ex exclusive. And the disingenuous part uh, from any politician standpoint is the argument that that money should go to insert whatever the cause may be. So whether you're talking about education, uh, whether you're talking about uh, creating jobs, that money should go there, and maybe it should. But understand, if you're not building the stadium, that money does not exist. So it's not going to education. It's not going to creating jobs. Uh, the, the last Chargers uh, plan in, uh, was about a hotel tax, and that's how they were going to generate the money for the city. Uh, that hotel tax is not in place. Therefore, that money does not exist. So any politician that's getting up on the stump and saying, I want this money to go to education, well, that money doesn't exist, so it's not going to education. 
there's a cost of doing business in any city government, and you either want to be involved in professional sports or you don't. And San Diego didn't want to be involved, so they're they're no longer involved. Um, there's a lot to get into on this one because uh, it, when you look at it, uh, this has been going on, John, right, for 16 years. They have not been able to come up with an agreement here, right? 16 years? Correct. Correct. Uh, and there was a last-ditch effort, and again, it was political in nature, and they were going to give the Spanos family a 50-year lease uh, for $1 a year uh, to stay at Qualcomm Stadium and then wait for the proper time to get the new stadium built. And, and again, people are going to look at that and say he's greedy, uh, he's going there. But you have to realize this is this is a family that's been dealing with the city for 15 years. They're not willing to budge uh, and to assume all of a sudden that after he signs this 50-year lease, they're going to budge. Well, I, I mean, as a businessman, he wouldn't be a billionaire if he believed that. Uh, and and to put it in, in a – I wrote about this today on, on FanRag Sports NFL, and it will be up there sometime tonight. Uh, you know, say you grow up in Philadelphia and you're a professional baseball player, the Philadelphia, Mike Trout, for instance, uh, and you're a Phillies fan and you grow up a Phillies fan and you become a professional baseball fan and you still love that team. But guess what? The New York Yankees or the, the L.A. Angels or the Boston Red Sox offer you more money. You're going to go to the other team because you're an adult. And you're making decisions as an adult for your family and what's best for you. And that's what you do as a business person. So I, I understand the frustration of fans, but, hey, this is, this is really at the feet of San Diego and nobody else. John, how much of this has a factor to do with the fact that it's in California, though, too, and the way those state laws are written because Mike and I talked earlier in the show and I brought up the fact that you need a two-thirds majority on that vote. That was 66 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, in other stadiums that got built, for example, uh, Jerry Jones built his stadium with only 54 percent approval and then Denver, they built their new stadium of 53 uh, over a majority but just barely over the line to get to that 66 is hard. And then I also read things about the fact that Basically, once the Padres got funding for Petco Park, that goodie bag of California money was kind of dried up, the lone exception being the 49ers' home that they built, and they did get local tax money from the hotels in Santa Clara. Yeah, I mean, uh, California's had a lot of problems uh, economically, and San Diego's in that. Uh, like a lot of cities, they have a pension crisis uh, that they're dealing with. Uh so they are struggling for funds, and that's why you have to come up with ways to create funds. But you're right. The system is rigged. Uh, you need a supermajority. And everybody knew they weren't getting 67% of the people uh, to agree on something like that. Because we all know there's a low information crowd when it comes to voting, when it comes to politics. And it's very, very easy to use that buzzword terminology. In this case, it's subsidizing billionaires. And then, and again, if you, and again, if you look at the city budget of San Diego, you will see that San Diego, like every other city in this country, subsidizes billionaires every day. Uh, but as I said, it's not on the front page of the newspaper. It's not highly publicized. So, so you, it, it's a diff, it's a difficult political football. Do you think that Spanos's biggest mistake was asking for public money in a state that had nothing left to give? No, because that's, as I said, that's the way the NFL does business in this area. And by the way, they, when it comes to building these stadiums, they have really, really upped uh, the ante as far as how much the league and, and the, the ownership generally puts in. If you look at the last few stadiums built, uh, whether it's Minnesota, as you mentioned, and, and Santa Clara, some of the other ones, uh, Atlanta coming up. Um, it's a, it's a three tiered partnership, uh, and the NFL has created that fund uh, to kick in significant money. Uh, but they're not 
they're very, very wary of setting a precedent where they're going to say, okay, San Diego doesn't have anything, uh, so we're just going to split it between the NFL and the Spanos family, and we're going to build a $1.5 billion stadium. Because if you do that, well, what happens? The next time, hey, the, the next city is going to say the same thing. Well, they didn't kick in. Why do we have to kick in? And then all of a sudden you have that domino effect, and that's that's part of it where it's being a businessman. You're either a good businessman or a bad businessman. And generally billionaires, they don't get to that position by making bad business deals. The $650 million that he spent to get out of San Diego, to your knowledge, was that money on the table to go towards a stadium? In other words, were the taxpayers voting on – a gap of between 950 million and to get the stadium done, or was his 650 million only to get them out of there, not to help build a new stadium in San Diego? No, understand. It, it was about it was earmarked at 1.4 or 1.5 billion, and basically they were asking for a third of that mm-hmm. from from the city and the local county. Uh, but understand the, this relocation fee, and it, it's been, it's put the NFL for that reason, because they don't want teams relocating. Uh, it, it, it can be paid over an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. Stan Kroenke okay. is so rich, he didn't have to do that. He just wrote a check. Uh, but I, I believe it's 20 years uh, you can spend uh, the time paying that off. So it, it's not the same as putting money up front, uh, as I said, unless you're Stan Kroenke and you want to do that. A uh, lot more to get into on this. Uh, how about – what about Phillip Rivers? Because the last time they threatened to move to L.A. two years ago, he didn't want any part of that. Uh, he has since signed a big contract. Do you anticipate him joining Romo as high-profile quarterbacks on the trade market? No, I don't. I, I think he came to grips with it because this is – uh, I, I think the people in San Diego kind of knew the writing was on the wall and that this was going to be an eventuality. So uh, the last time he was having contract issues, I think that was, you know, he's a he's a Tennessee guy uh, and he's more of a rural guy, uh, but he made his peace with it and he understood this was there was a very good chance that this was happening and he, he was eventually going to play in Los Angeles. And, He'll be the quarterback of the Chargers next season. All right, so uh, you anticipate there being no issues there. Do we? Do you think it's the end of football in San Diego, or do you think they will try that the NFL or the city will try to lure somebody else there, or the NFL relocate somebody there? Well, you never say ever. I mean, Cleveland's the perfect example. This is the funny thing from uh, the standpoint, and it's not just the NFL. You can look at teams that have moved – uh, from the NBA uh, and even the NHL over the years. Seattle and the NBA is a perfect example. Cleveland in the NFL uh, is a perfect example. They lose these teams, and then they end up spending 10 times the money it would have cost them to keep the original team to get a new team. And it just shows you the short-sighted nature uh, of politics in general. And, and they always kick the can down the road. <laughs> And then all of a sudden the can is down the road and you're like, oh, God, we don't have a football team. We need a football team. And, yeah, at 10 years from now, there'll be another stadium situation and that team will be using San Diego as one of the cities. So, no, I'm not going to say there's never going to be a team in San Diego because they're going to find out pretty quickly to be – uh, you know, a high-profile city in this country, it's probably a good idea to have a football team. All right. Uh, you know, th- this story is uh, crazy. First off, do you think, I don't, do you think Los Angeles will even care or support the Chargers? I, well, they didn't support or care about the Rams. <laughs> the TV ratings... The, the, the local station in Los Angeles uh, lobbied the NFL to play a Raiders game late in the season instead of a Rams game. And it's proven from the last time people forget. I, I mean, there's a lot of things to do in Los Angeles, and obviously the weather is beautiful. And if you're not competitive, they're not going to support you. 
It's as simple as that. If you are competitive, they will support you. And people like to latch on to a winner. So I think it depends on how successful they are on the field. And that holds true for the Rams as well. Uh, and, you know, to have a two mark the NFL didn't want this. I mean, it's it's blatantly obvious they did not want two teams in Los Angeles. They wanted it as as a one-team town. But as I mentioned on the show yesterday, and this holds true with Oakland and the Raiders as well, if it comes to a point where the the city is not willing to get involved at all, at some point you have to let the team do what it has to do. All right. Uh, well, I'm sure uh, it's not the end of that story. More stuff will uh, continue to come out here, and uh, we'll uh, keep an eye on it because I do think it's – just imagine your your team just bolting on you, no pun intended, with the Bolts, the Chargers, heading to L.A. But uh, that is – and they're going to play at a 30,000-seat stadium for the next two years, and uh, I'd be hard-pressed to think if they could fill a 30,000-seat stadium. I think they'll fill that one. They certainly wouldn't fill the Coliseum, but – yeah, where the uh, the StubHub Center, which is basically an MLS stadium, um, uh, is going to be their short-term home before they build the three billion dollar facility, which the Rams and the Chargers will share. And and how was that paid for, Kroenke? Uh, uh, Kroenke's paying most of it. The NFL's paying a lot of it. Remember, the NFL, that's going to be sort of – Jerry Jones has described it as NFL Disneyland. The NFL Network is going to have offices there. There's going to be an entire campus. uh, And it's more than just uh, the Rams and now the Chargers. But, yeah, I mean, Stan Kroenke is – even amongst a bunch of rich people, as NFL owners are, Stan Kroenke is really, really rich. So even amongst his his brethren, he can he can basically do whatever he wants to do. All right. Speaking of the Rams, uh, they have hired their coach. He will turn 31 years old on January the 24th, which is uh, the same day that I will turn uh, 40. There, Sean McVay is the youngest head coach in NFL history. The Rams fell in love with him so much so, John, they didn't take another interview. They hired him today on the spot. Uh, you talked a little bit about him throughout the week, but Sean McVay is the new head coach in L.A. Yeah, I mean, he's an offensive guy, so that's a step forward because I thought that was a key. Uh, if you're going to take Jared Goff, number one, you got to surround him with offensive-minded people uh, who are good. Uh, Sean McVay, I mean, you said it. I talked about it yesterday on the show. I, he's 30, going to be 31, the youngest coach in NFL history. There's not a a lot of resume to look at. Certainly, Kirk Cousins has developed very, very well uh, over the last two seasons in in Washington. Uh, But this, to me, is a – it's swinging for the fences again. It's trying to get the really, really young, up-and-coming coach and hoping he's around for two decades or so. And we'll see if it works out, but the odds are certainly against them. Uh, also, uh, here locally, Greg Roman back in the league. He's going to Baltimore. Now, his title is kind of like as uh, assistant tight end coach, uh, but that seems like code word for help us learn how to run the ball better. Yeah, yeah. Very similar situation to when Pat Shermer went to the Vikings last season uh, as a longtime offensive coordinator. Uh, and he, he got the tight ends coach job. And it was sort of a wink-wink deal uh, that you're going to be the offensive coordinator once we run North Turner out of here. I'm not saying the Ravens want to run Marty Morningwig out as offensive coordinator, but John Harbaugh has a history of replacing his offensive coordinators in season. And this puts a lot of pressure on, on Marty to get that offense going in the right direction. Let me uh, clean up that title, too, by the way. He's not the assistant tight ends coach. He's a senior offensive assistant. He's actually the tight ends coach. There's no, like, tight ends. Then, But you're right. Uh, 
220, 221, tomato, tomato. Just get you in the building. I it's just, like you had, right. we, we have a line item here that we can't call you something else. It's, you're on this line here. That's how we have to pay you. Additional pay. Uh, uh, John, Juan Castillo's back. He's with the Bills. They uh, they hired him as the offensive line coach. Uh, thoughts on Juan Castillo back in. Some the irony NFL. there, don't you think? Uh, McDermott. <laughs> Castillo. McDermott yeah, yeah, hires yeah, no, Castillo, just, who replaced him as the defensive coordinator. This is a, a league about relationships, and obviously they know each other well. And that might have been the strangest move in the Andy Reid era in Philadelphia. Uh, and you notice Juan has not been a defensive coordinator since he was the defensive coordinator here. Uh, but he's a good offensive line coach, so, uh, and, it, and I don't think anybody doubts that, so. Uh, obviously, he knows Sean well, and Sean's comfortable with him, so it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he was. Uh, has he been back in the game since? I mean, what was he? How, what's he been doing the last couple? Oh, of yeah, years? he was in Baltimore. He was in Baltimore as an assistant coach. Uh, he, he was always. He's been in the league the entire time. He's, uh, as I said, he just went back to the offensive side of the ball uh, where he belonged. That was just. It, it, you rarely see it in the NFL when Andy Reid tried to do, and there's a reason you rarely see it because, <laughs> it is, I mean, defensive coordinators, they spend their entire careers trying to uh, stop offenses, and you can't just say, oh, because he he's a good offensive line coach, he knows what defenses need to do to stop things. And it obviously didn't work out, but, yeah, he's back on the offensive side of the ball. He's always been, and that's where he belongs. The Ravens are winning, in my book, John McBowen, for creative position titles. In 2013, Juan Castillo was the run game coordinator. And now, of course, Greg Roman, the tight ends coach, but senior offensive assistant. Like, uh, all creative type of job titles that basically, as Mike said, just get him. Yeah, it was just, and that's one of the things. It was because obviously John Harbaugh was also here, so he knew Juan Castillo. So it was a situation where he wanted to get him on the staff, already had an offensive line coach, so you create the new convoluted title, uh, and and that's how things happen. And that's when you bring in a longtime coordinator like Roman, and you have a long-time coordinator like Morningwig, you can't just go tight ends coach. They need a little more cachet, so they create these inventive titles. All right, uh, John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN, and, of course, uh, at J.F. McMullen. I think uh, going back to our uh, lead topic in this uh, NFL conversation, um, the Chargers moved to a city that virtually doesn't want them. Uh, and we'll Roger see. Goodell says they worked tirelessly to try and stay there. I don't know. uh <laughs> Yeah, well, for 16 years they kept working at it. They couldn't get a deal hey, done, I, I, but I'll they found you, a place. Rogers got a yeah. Rogers got a bad reputation, but he's telling the truth. I mean, they worked. They tried everything humanly possible to get something done in San Diego. And when you don't have a partner willing to get involved, there's either two things. You're right. I mean, there's no question. The NFL has the money to be able to do this on their own. There's no question. So if that's going to be your end game, and and you want to blame them. Uh, that's fine, but as I said, you 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 generally don't get to the position uh, of being a juggernaut by making bad business deals, and, and that would set a, a very bad precedent. So, if the local partnership is not willing to get involved, the NFL is just not going to it's not going to budge. Yeah, I just don't see this as a win for the NFL. I don't see them being supported there. We'll see how it goes. Uh, and that, of course, uh, the Eagles will play both the Rams and the Chargers in L.A. So true trips to L.A. for the Eagles this season. And uh, we'll pre preview tomorrow's matchups with John uh, and get his picks for all of the matchups tomorrow on the show here on 97.3. Thanks, pal. Hey, thanks, guys.